So let's read Ephesians chapter 1, verse 15 to verse 23, and we're going to get into the apostles' prayer for the saints. Ephesians 1, beginning at verse 15, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. So as we've been going through chapter 1, Paul has been outlining the blessings that believers have in the Lord Jesus Christ, and he now prays that believers will come to understand and appreciate those blessings. Now, he's praying for them. We ask the question, what is it that has moved him to prayer? Well, what moved him to prayer, he says to us, is that visitors have come and given him a good report. People had taken the time to come and see him in jail and informed him of the condition of the church there in Ephesus. He was under arrest. Now, why was he under arrest? As I was reading this, I began to think, and preparing, I began to think that I ought to explain a little bit as to why the Apostle Paul was a jailbird, and he was. He went to, he went to prison, he went to jail several times in his ministry and all, and uh, Ephesians is one of those epistles or letters that is referred to as a prison epistle. So you see, he's under arrest. And so let me give you a summary of why he's under arrest. When you begin to read in the book of Acts, Paul had been in the city of Jerusalem. And what he had done is he had entered into the temple grounds. As he had entered into the temple grounds there in Jerusalem, an unbelieving Jew had stirred the people against him, claiming that Paul was anti-Jewish. He had said that Paul taught against the people, the law, and the temple. He also claimed that Paul had brought Gentiles into the temple and in doing so had defiled it. You see that in Acts 21. They had seen somebody by the name of Trophimus. He was an Ephesian. They had seen him with Paul and they assumed that Paul had taken him in the temple. And so a mob had gathered together and and it was a dangerous place, but Paul was allowed to speak to this mob. And, and when he did so, he began to give his testimony. As he was speaking, he told them that God had sent him to, to, to reach the Gentiles. And when he got to that point, Acts 22, verse 22 says, that the crowd listened to Paul until he said this. Then they raised their voices and shouted, rid the earth of him. He is not fit to live. When the mob got out of control, the commander removed Paul for his own safety. And he wanted to know why he had been accused by the Jews, so he assembled the chief priests. Now, when Paul was standing before these chief priests, he noted that some of them were Pharisees and some of them were Sadducees. Now, because the Sadducees deny resurrection, Paul began to speak concerning the resurrection. He said, it's because of my belief and teaching in the resurrection that I stand before you now. And when he did that, it created a great a great. Uh, uh, chaos ensued, we'll put it that way. This was a point of contention between the two. They began to argue. The argument got violent. It was so violent, the commander ordered Paul back to the barracks. He was then jailed for two years, and finally, he stood before the governor, a man at that time by the name of Festus. Now, Paul saw that Festus was partial to the Jews, and so instead of going through a mockery of a, of a hearing, he appealed to Caesar. You see that in Acts 25. So before going to Rome, he stood before a man by the name of King Agrippa, and then he went to Rome. While awaiting trial in Rome, Paul was under house arrest, and it was during that time that he wrote the prison epistles, Philemon, Colossians, 
Philippians as well as this book here, Ephesians. While he was in prison, he was able to receive visitors. Acts 28, verses 30 and 31 says that Paul dwelt two whole years in his own rented house and received all who came to him, preaching the kingdom of God, teaching the things which concern the Lord Jesus Christ with all confidence, no one forbidding him. And so he was continuing to minister and all. He could receive visitors, and so visitors have come. And some from, uh, so from those who had visited him, Paul was able to receive information about the condition of the churches, and, and he was blessed to hear that the Ephesian church is doing well. Notice verse 15, how he says it. He said, I also heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for the saints. That was the good report that caused him to pray with such joy. He was blessed. He was blessed by how the Lord was moving in the church. When the church is doing well, it blesses mature believers. It will especially bless the pastor of that church. In 3 John, verses 3 and 4, John, the apostle, said, It gave me great joy to have some brothers come and tell about your faithfulness to the truth and how you continue to walk in the truth. He went on to say, I have no greater joy than to hear that my children are walking in the truth. So when a pastor, an apostle, as, as Paul, but a pastor, a church leader, gets a report that the church is doing well, it causes them to have great joy. And that's what Paul is feeling. You see, every congregation, every church has a reputation. And that reputation in the community may be better known than we think. All churches have these reputations, and some have good reputations and others not so good. You see, the reputation of that church is produced by people who attend the church. The reputation of that church is, is, is known by the pastor. It's known by the congregation. And, and Paul, when he was writing to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2, said it like this. He said, you yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everybody. And so when the church disperses after a church service, that's when the church's reputation is, is magnified throughout the community. And, and every pastor knows that their church has a reputation. And when you read the Bible, you see that the churches that are listed very often are, are mentioned with certain reputations. Let me give you some examples. For example, the church at Rome. When you read the, the letter to the Romans, the church at Rome was known for something, was known for its faith in Christ. When Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 1, verse 8, he said this to them. He said, your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. So the Roman church was known for its faith. That was the reputation. The church in Thessalonica, the Thessalonians had, had a reputation for works and love, for endurance, evangelism, for perseverance through trials. When Paul wrote to them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3, he said this. He said, we continually remember before our God and Father your work, Produced by your faith, your labor, prompted by love, your endurance, inspired by hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Thessalonians 1.8, he said, From you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, he said this, he said, We ought always to thank God for you, brothers, rightly so. Because your faith is growing more and more. And the love every one of you has for each other is increasing. Therefore, among God's churches, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials that you're enduring. So you see churches have reputations. We see the reputation of the Romans. We see the reputation of the Thessalonians. But we also know of the reputation of the Corinthians. To be called a Corinthian was a dirty word during the time of the writing of uh, First and Second uh, Corinthians. And, and unfortunately, Corinth was pretty much living up to the reputation. The church at Corinth was uh, living, up for the, uh, living up to the reputation of Corinthians. It was, this church was known, but it was known for its carnality and divisiveness. In 1 Corinthians 1, 10 and 11, he said, I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ 
that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's house have informed me that there are quarrels among you. So you can have a reputation. Every church does, and the Ephesians do. The Ephesian church has a great reputation. They're known for their faith towards God and their love for the saints, verse 15 tells us. Genuine faith is manifested in love towards others, especially for those who are in the household of God. And that's why he speaks of their faith in Jesus and their love for all the saints. Remember, once again, what is the mark of a, of a genuine Christian? What is the mark of a believer? What is the birthmark? Some of you perhaps have birthmarks. I mentioned to you that I have one. I have a birthmark. It's here on my, on my rib cage. And uh, my mom had a birthmark. And, and so I sometimes felt that I didn't belong to the family. So my mom, I'd say, I'm just a little kid you found on the street. You adopted. I'm not yours. You know, I said that when I was 60 years old. I mean, I never, <laughs> I never got over it. But I used to say that because in my family, I, I, I didn't look like everybody else. My, I have blue eyes, blue-green eyes. I have light skin, brown hair, and the rest of my family, black hair, olive-complected. Uh, my dad had blue eyes, but I just didn't seem to fit in. And so I would say that. I'd say, I'm just somebody you found on the street and you brought into the house. And my mom would lift up her, her blouse, and there is a birthmark on her, and she'd point to it. And she'd say, this is my mark, and you have my mark. You belong to me. And she would do that as a, when I was a little boy. So when we, Marie and I, had our first baby, Corinne, what's the first thing I did? I lifted up, you know, and I looked, and there on her rib cage is a birthmark. So she has the mark of the beast. I mean, she has a mark. <laughs> she has a mark of her father. <laughs> And you want to know something? When she had our, our first grandson, my Josiah, when I held him when he was just born, she said, Dad, look at his rib cage. And my Josiah, my firstborn grandson, has a birthmark. You know, and you do too. And the birthmark you have is the love of God. By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have love one for another. What is the mark of the believer? The love of Christ. And so in this passage, he's commending them because their love that they have for one another for the Lord Jesus Christ is seen also in the things that they do for one another. Christian love is that love that doesn't pick and choose amongst who is the most beautiful person. I think one of the sad things that this world does that the church should never do is to, to look at the one they think is the beautiful person to the ignoring of the person that may not be outwardly beautiful. I believe that we have to be aware of those things because that can even happen in churches. The love of God and love for one another is revealed in compassion and concern. It's love for one another. 1 John 4, 19 and 20, we love him because he first loved us. If a man says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? We see that love in the ministry of Jesus Christ. He, he cared for the lepers, and the cripples, the possessed, the, the promiscuous. He, he cared for the tax gatherers. He, 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 he cared for the grieving families. And Christian love is demonstrated by service and sacrifice. This church exhibited it. And it's their faith and their love that prompted Paul to, to pray for them. And he did it with a thankful, thankful heart. Notice verse 16. Now he says that he didn't cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. I think of you. And when I do, I lift you up to the Lord and I give thanks for you. Isn't that a beautiful thought, guys? That when someone thinks of you, they give thanks for you. That's a beautiful thought. That somebody would actually lift you up in their prayers and simply say, you know, Father, I sure love them. Thank you so much for putting them in my life. Thank you so much for the good influence they have been to me. Thank you, Jesus. Every thought about them, Lord, is, is good towards them. It reminds me of what Paul said to the Philippian church in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, 
when he said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy. He says in verse 17, as he's giving thanks and making mention, he goes on to say, this is what he's making mention of. This is what I am praying for. Verse 17, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. I'm praying that God may give you certain things. Now, remember, not only is he an apostle, but he's a teacher. And as a teacher, he's instructing them about what they have in Jesus Christ. And so the fact is, it's God who gives spiritual understanding. He does that through the Holy Spirit. In John 14, 26, Jesus said it like this. He said, the helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. So it is God who, who gives understanding through the power of the Spirit. Those who don't have the Lord don't understand the things of the Lord. That's why in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, Paul said the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they're spiritually discerned. So when he was speaking about this natural man here in 1 Corinthians 2.14, and he said the natural man does not receive, the natural man is the one who's called the unspiritual man, the one who has been born again, the one who doesn't have the Spirit of God dwelling within them. The natural man is the carnal man, the unredeemed man. So he says the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God. When he says the natural man does not receive, that word receive is a Greek word that means does not welcome. It's like someone's knocking at your door and you look through the side curtain there and you see it and you don't open the door. The natural man is looking at the Spirit of God, we'll say in a picture, knocking at the door, but he will not receive him. He does not welcome him in. So the natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. Why? They're foolishness to him. The things of the Lord are moronic. The word foolish is where we also use the word moronic. It's a Greek word speaking of imbecilic. It makes no sense to them. You as a believer try to speak to someone who doesn't know the Lord. It's, it's not like you're better and they're worse. It's not one of those things. It's just they don't know what you mean. So you say, well, you know what? The Lord blessed me because he opened the door for me to get a good job. And they say, that job would have been there anyway. I mean, what are you saying God gave you the job for? Come on, didn't you knock on the door? Didn't you give your application? Didn't you? It was you who did it. But you tell a brother in the Lord or a sister in the Lord, I got a job. The Lord opened the door, and they'll go, hallelujah, praise God. Do they have another opening? <laughs> because they understand, right? They do. They get it. They understand. Prayer for them isn't the last thing they do when they're in a circumstance. It's the first thing they do, because the natural man doesn't do that. The natural man says, I can't do anything else but pray. But the spiritual man says, the first thing I need to do is pray. See, it's reversed. It's a reverse kind of order. The natural man doesn't receive the things of the Spirit of God. They are foolishness. In Neither can he know them, for they're spiritually discerned. Neither can he understand them completely, because it takes the Holy Spirit to show you what divine truth is. And so Paul is praying for these Ephesians that God may give them understanding. I am praying that God will give you, he says, the spirit of wisdom and revelation. That he may give you the spirit of wisdom. May you come to understand how precious fellowship with God truly is. Because that in and of itself is real wisdom. And may you come to realize what you already have in Jesus Christ. That is revelation. So it isn't that we are lacking something. Because in Christ, we already have everything we need. Sometimes we simply don't know it. Sometimes we don't make use of it. Sometimes we simply don't believe it. But we have it. It's like that old woman, older woman whose son was in the military. And he had been gone for a number of years. He had been in active service. He'd been overseas. It had been a number of years since mama had seen her, her boy. 
And he came home to surprise Mama. And he went up to the old house that he grew up in, hadn't seen in years. And he comes to that picket fence, and, and the gate is coming off, off, the, it's off its hinge. And he looks around, and there are weeds everywhere. And he steps up into the, into the, the porch, the front porch, and the screen door is, is ripped and knocks on the door. It rattles. Mama opens the door, and he steps in, and Mama's, her clothing is old and disheveled, and she, Mama, what's, what happened to the house? What happened? What happened? Oh, honey, you know, I don't have any money. I don't have any money. She says, I couldn't keep it up. I'm barely making ends meet. He says, but Mama, what did you do with, with all of the all of the money I kept sending you. She said, what are you talking about? He had been sending her money orders. She didn't know what a money order was. So she said, what do you mean? He said, I sent you money orders. Every month I took out of my pay and, and I sent you money to support you. What's it look like? He says, well, she says, well, come over. She, he walks into a room and she had wallpapered the wall with the money orders. She had the resources and didn't use them. And a lot of Christians are that way. We have in Christ so many riches, and we just don't use them. Maybe we don't believe it. We never exercise it. No, we, we have what we need in Christ. We need to know that. That's what Paul wants us to understand. In Second Peter, in chapter 1, verse 3, it reads, His divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. Now, this doesn't mean that we shouldn't seek the Lord for a deeper relationship with him. Seeking to have a deeper relationship should be our top priority. A man that I like to read devotionally, his name is A.W. Tozer. Tozer said, I want deliberately to encourage this mighty longing after God. The lack of it has brought us to our present lowest state. So we ought to be pursuing God, hungering for him, the desire for God, the hunger for fellowship with him. That's the Christian's driving force. Jeremiah 29, 13, in the Old Testament, God said, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. In Psalm 84, verse 2, the psalmist said, I long, yes, I faint with longing to enter the courts of the Lord. With my whole being, body and soul, I will shout joyfully to the living God. The desire for God and hunger for fellowship should be our driving force. And as Christians, we can have that deep and personal relationship with the Lord. It reminds me of Exodus 33, 11, where the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. We can have a relationship with God. It's what he, he desires us to have. And Paul wants us to know that. Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing I have desired of the Lord, and that will I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord, to inquire in his temple. You come to faith in Christ, and, and your road in salvation begins, and, and you're born again, and, and you begin to pursue him, and you pursue him, not the things he gives you, but the person he is. In John 17, verse 3, this is eternal life that they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. I think it's a very improper attitude for a believer to have where they only want to pursue things and not the person. In marriage, that doesn't work. In marriage, that wouldn't work. You don't pursue things from that person. You pursue that person. I've said this before. I'll say it quickly. Home isn't my house. Home is wherever my wife is. I'm at home when I'm with her. It's a relationship. It's not a destination. It's not possessions. No, it's knowing him, knowing him. And that's what he's praying. Notice what he's saying in verse 18. He says that the eyes of their understanding, he says, may be enlightened. Now, the word understanding is an interesting word. It's the word cardias. It's where we get the word heart. And the heart speaks in, in the Hebrew way of thinking, of understanding. What, what, what that speaks of is the inner man in its entirety. So he's saying this, he's saying, may you be made completely and entirely aware of heavenly things. 
May you be aware that you are adopted as God's children through Jesus. May you know for certain that this has been God's pleasure to do so. May you cherish and live in the freedom from bondage that God gave you when he redeemed you. May you come to know deeply of the costly grace of God that made this possible. May you eagerly await the obtaining of your inheritance in heaven and live as if you expect to be there. May this understanding provoke you to live to the praise of his glory. And so that's what he's praying. You see, the more you drench yourself in the word of God, the deeper your understanding of the things that are awaiting you will grow. In Colossians 3.16, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's what worship is anyway, isn't it? It's singing with grace in our hearts, not to the person in front of us, but to the Lord. I'm thankful for the scripture that says, make a joyful sound unto the Lord, a joyful noise unto him, because sometimes that's what it is. It's a noise, but it's joyful, and it's a good thing. Well, listen, Paul is saying, notice, you once, you once were in spiritual darkness. When we get to chapter 4, we'll get a greater understanding of what they one time were, which would include us. When we get to Ephesians 4, 17 through 19, this is what he'll say. He says, I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding, separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality so as to indulge in every kind of impurity, and they're full of greed. He said they're, they're darkened. They're darkened. Their understanding is darkened. That word darkened means to be blinded or obscured. Understanding, again, speaks of the inability. They're in, unable to discern the deep things. He says you've been separated. You're estranged. You're unable to participate in the things of God due to ignorance. Ignorance is often the result of willful blindness and rejection, and the result has been as you are hardened. Before you came to faith in Christ, you were hardened. The word hardness in the Greek language is, speaks of a callousness, but it also is a word that's, uh, that's a, a strong word. It, it's speaking of spiritual stupidity. He said, this is what you were before you came to faith in Christ, but you need to know something. This is a key. You need to realize you are no longer in spiritual darkness. You need to realize that. When you came to faith in Christ, your darkened minds, the Bible says, were enlightened. The word enlightened means to shine or to shed light. It speaks of being brightened. When I was in India, I, I saw the gurus in India. I, I, I've spent a month in India. Two different occasions. I went once for uh, 16 days, in the other, I think, 12 days. So I spent a month in, in India, had opportunity to see some of the guru gurus that they have, some of them in places called Ramaswaram and different places. And uh, what they would do is they will have a devotee, somebody who will come to them and they're seeking instruction or prayer or something. And sometimes what the... Uh, what the guru will do is they'll press their, their, their forehead, speaking of this eye that they're going to open up. And, and, uh, and what they'll do is they'll press there, and there are those who will report that they see a bright light that will shine. Well, there's a gland here in your forehead, and when it's pressed in a certain way, it gives an electric charge. It gives a sense of, of illumination, and that's where they say they have been enlightened. That's where that phrase is uh, coming from. That's what it's referring to, spiritual enlightenment problem is, is no, I didn't get enlightened because somebody put a thumb in my forehead. I got enlightened because the Holy Spirit brings light. That's, that's how you're enlightened. The Bible says in Isaiah 9 verse 2, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Psalm 18 verse 28, for you will light my candle, the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. 
In 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 6, God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. In creation, when God created light, let there be light. That's what God has done in you. When you got saved, you, when I got saved, we who walked in darkness were spiritually stupid, ignorant, against God, pursuing the things of the world. And then he enlightened you. He enlightened our darkness. And now we can say, I, I see clearly now for the first time. I see clearly now because God opened up our eyes to see. And so what does he want? He says, verse 18, that you may know, that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What are the riches of the glory? He prays that they might understand the hope of his calling, riches of the glory, and the greatness of his power. That you may know, that word know, that you may perceive, that you may perceive the hope of his calling, that, that, that seeing, being enlightened, may become knowing. May God move before you so much that it becomes the natural pattern of your life. May God move in your life so much that you begin to just be so sensitive to the Spirit's leading that you know he's saying, talk to this person. Or he's saying, go here. Or he's saying, stop. May you become so sensitive. May that happen. This is a prayer of Paul that we would know what the Spirit does in our lives so we might move in that hope that he has, that we may see those things and that we might see the hope Notice he says in verse 18 that you may know what is the hope of his calling. What is the hope of his calling? Well, it's, it's to be conformed into the image of Jesus Christ. God's plan for our lives is that we all will have resurrection glory and be like him. In Galatians 5 verse 5, Paul said this. He said, for through the spirit we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. In 1 John 3, verse 2, Beloved, now we are children of God. What we will be has not yet been made known. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We shall see him as he is. Oh, my goodness. I don't understand that. But one day... I will fully understand that. I will know, like the Revelation, when we studied through Revelation a while back, I, I will know that the lion is a lamb. I will know that. I will know that Jesus bore those stripes on my behalf. I'll know that in a more full sense. Because sometimes I don't realize it to the depth it should affect me. I'll know that he... He bore that cross for me in a deeper sense. I'll understand more deeply the tears that he wept over Jerusalem and for a friend who had died. I'll understand that. I'll understand some of the things that I don't understand now, why he allowed this to happen or how come that took place. At that point, there's no need for an explanation because I will know even as I am known, it will all make sense at one time, it's all going to be one of those aha and those moments where, oh, it makes sense. Why did I doubt you, God? Why did I think you didn't love me? Why did I think you treated me unfairly? Why? I'm so wrong. Those things will know. He wants us to grow that in that knowledge now to know that our God is control of all things and he's doing a work in us right now and no matter what it may be and how it appears right now, it all works out in the end. As I've shared with you before, one of the young men in one of my classes that I teach asked me, what is the deepest lesson you've ever learned as a Christian? I've been walking with the Lord for a while now and I said, what is the deepest lesson? I can say that quickly. It all works out in the end. It all works out in the end. It all tied together. I just didn't see it being woven in the mighty will of God. I didn't see it. But now I'm starting to see it. Oh, you allowed that to happen. So I would go over here. 
to do this so that I could meet this person over here who is going to do, now I get it. And so that's starting to take place in a little bit for me, and prayerfully it'll be taking place for all of us so we will know even as we're known. Second, he says that we may know what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. That word riches speaks of abundance, of something valuable. He says, oh, my prayer is that believers will come to understand salvation. The hope of being with Christ and enjoying his blessings will become the number one desire of your heart, motivating you. In Romans 8, 16, and 17, the Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit. We are children of God, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. And then third, what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe? The exceeding greatness of his power is an incredible statement. The exceeding greatness is a phrase that speaks of the immeasurable might of God himself. The infinite power of God was displayed when he resurrected Jesus Christ. And the same power that resurrected Jesus dwells in us. In Romans 8, 11, if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you you. The spirit that raised the dead body of Christ dwells in me, dwells in you. You are the temple of the spirit of God, and the spirit of God dwells in you. Oh, that we would understand that. We need to understand that we have power through Jesus Christ. It is the same power that raised him from the dead that resides in us. It's the power of the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. You shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the uttermost parts of the earth. This Holy Spirit, the promise of the Father, who has come upon those who have waited for him and said, God, may your Spirit baptize me in your power. That Holy Spirit dwells within us who are the temple of God. And he speaks on, and he continues in verse 20, and he says, which he worked in Christ, when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places. He's saying that God raised Jesus first. He raised him from the dead. Like it says in Acts 13, 30, God raised him from the dead. But second, he says, God seated Jesus at his right hand. In scripture, often the right hand is a place of power and authority. It's a place of power and authority. Exodus 15, verse 6, Your right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, has dashed the enemy in pieces. 1 Peter 3, 22, He has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. And so this same divine power is at work in those of us who believe. When we, um, when we perform baptisms, I will read out of the book of Romans in chapter 6. And I will read this. Romans 6, verse 4. We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may walk in newness of life. The old man is, is dead. The old man, that old nature, that old person. We have been buried in Christ. And, and I speak to the people, and some of you have heard me say this. And when we're going to baptize, and I give this introductory message prior to the baptism. I say that if you've ever gone to a funeral, you've ever, ever gone to a burial. And most have, many have, some haven't. And you go to the graveside. There's something, perhaps I'm unique in this, I, I don't think so, but I don't know. There's something about when the casket is lowered into the open grave and, and when that tractor comes and pushes the dirt onto the coffin, 
There's a finality to that. There's a finality to that. It's just dead and buried. Dead and buried. My father's mother, my grandmother, dies. My dad is a very strong man, and I'm standing with him. And we're viewing my little grandma's seed, her body, in a casket. My grandma was four foot ten, little thing. And my dad says, you see those hands, son? And I look at my grandma's hands folded in front of her. She's wearing a little peasant dress that she would wear. And her little hands are gnarled with arthritis. And I'm looking at them. I said, yeah, Daddy, I see them. He says, those, those hands made a lot of tortillas. <laughs> <laughs> my, dad, my dad had a sweet sense of humor, and I, I laughed. And I said, I'm sure, that I, I know they did, because when we went over on Saturdays, Grandma would always make us tortillas. I said, yeah, I know, Daddy. He said, she used them on my head more than once. <laughs> and he, he was in good spirit, you know, as you would expect. But when we went to the gravesite, and I stood next to him shoulder to shoulder, and they said the last words, and the casket had been lowered, I'll never forget how that when the, that tractor, that small tractor, pushed the dirt into that open grave and it hit that coffin, my father just let out. He, ch he choked a sob that was so deep. I, I felt it. So I, I believe there's just something about the dirt over the coffin that says it's over. It's done. They're dead. And that's baptism for you. When you went into the water, dead and buried, it's over. It's done. And then you came out resurrected in eternal life. That's the picture. That's what we have in Christ, dead and buried, but alive because of him. And so we may walk in newness of life. He's praying, may God cause you to understand this. In Christ, we've received power, and his power resides in us, and it brings us to glory in him. We haven't been left fatherless. We're not spiritual orphans. We don't care for ourselves. He cares for us. In verse 21, he goes on and he says, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. He's exalted to the highest dignity and honor that exists and, and, and could ever be imagined. God raised Christ from the dead. And Jesus gives life to those of us who believe. He raises a sinner from the death of sin and gives them power, the power of everlasting life. In John 5, 24, most assuredly, Jesus said, I say unto you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life, shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. We have life in him. It's far above all principality, all power and might and dominion. He is above every name. Jesus is exalted above principality, power, might and dominion and name. Notice that these words speak of all possible forms of power. Principality and power speaks of rulership. It speaks of governmental power. It can speak of human government, but it also speaks of all created power. In this context, Paul is speaking of angelic power, both that which is good and that which is evil. When he speaks of might, this speaks of physical and spiritual power. When he speaks of dominion, that speaks of the lowest level of authority. But all the words apply to angelic beings of great rank and authority. And he's making it clear, Christ is above all. In verse 22 and 23, he put all things under his feet, gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. God has given Christ all power in heaven and earth. He owns the church. He, he bought it with his own blood. In 1 Peter 3:22. The apostle said that Jesus has gone into heaven, is at the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers having been made subject to him. Colossians 1, 15 through 18. 
He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He's before all things. In him all things hold together. He is also head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. And ultimately, all will bow before Jesus. And he wants us to know that. In Philippians 2, 9 and 10, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. Every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every time I read that, I think one thing. I think this. Every knee, every tongue, which means Buddha, will say, you are Lord. Which means Muhammad will say, you are Lord. Every knee will bow. Every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And so I do that now because he is my Lord. But every knee will bow, even those who rejected him. And they will have to say, you are Lord. So let's do it now because we're going to do it one way or another, right? <laughs> so I made a choice a long time ago. I bow my knee before the Father in heaven and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent to redeem me. I bow my knee before him. And he speaks in verse 23 of the church, which he says is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. He is the one who completes or fills everything. The church he bought with his own blood is what makes his total dominion complete. The church he saved is the crowning evidence of his complete lordship. And as the church is his body, he loves us and he takes care of us. We'll see in chapter 5, when we get there in about three years, when in <laughs> Ephesians chapter 5, verses 29 and 30, no one ever hated his own flesh but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church, for we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. The Lord takes care of us. When we get to Ephesians 5 and I begin to teach a series, it'll be a series on marriage and the family because you see that in Ephesians 5. I will be sharing about the relationship we husbands have with our wives. My wife needs to know that I, that I love her enough to lay my life down for her. She needs to know that. She does know that. That I'm to wash her with the water of the word. That I'm supposed to be a spiritual leader. We'll look at those things. Why? Because Jesus takes care of us. Because he has washed us with the water of the word. Because he has regenerated us. Because he is our, our master, he is our Lord, he is our Savior. But he loves us as, as a groom loves a bride. And when we get there, we'll see the depth of how, how God loves us and, and how we men and, and the wives also will love their husbands. And it's a great, great portion of Scripture where we see the practicality of, of what marriage is intended to, to, to demonstrate. Marriage is intended to demonstrate Christ and his bride. That's why divorce is such a serious thing to God. That's why in Malachi, God said, I hate divorce. Why? Because it breaks the image that God intended marriage to have. That Jesus and his bride forever united together with him loving us, caring for us, protecting us, and us loving him in return. That's what marriage is supposed to be. We'll see that when we get to chapter 5. But as he's closed here, he wants us to know we belong to him. He loves us. He laid his life down for us. And we can walk in newness of life as we yield to Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that you.